He is Perry Mason and Clarence Darrow all rolled into one. America's most famous trial attorney, Robert Shapiro, the man who defended O.J. Simpson in what was called the trial of the century, is busy turning the legal system on its ear yet again. He joins me now for a very, very personal interview as Bruce W. Cook interviews. I think most people don't believe that justice is served today, and frankly, I think a lot of it stems from the O.J. Simpson trial, which obviously you were intimately involved with. Is justice really served in terms of right versus wrong, or is the system served in terms of fair versus unfair, uh, or in terms of getting to an end point versus not? You have, you have several different areas that you have to examine when you discuss this. First is the difference between legal justice and moral justice uh, on the criminal side. Uh, when people generally talk about justice, they're talking about moral justice. If there was a higher power to make a decision as to right or wrong, what would that decision be? But didn't our laws come from Judeo-Christian teachings and writings into the English common law? Isn't it really based on morality instead of just, quote unquote, Justice? No, I don't think our system is based on morality. Okay. Uh, our system is based on liberty. And that is uh, a, a very, very high price that we pay for freedom and justice in this country. And the cost in this country is that we know that innocent people sometimes will be convicted. More and more we read in the newspapers that so-called victims of injustice are being released from prison because DNA is freeing them. What is that doing to our society and to the legal profession and to lawyers such as yourself dealing with criminal cases? It, it, it's a horrible, horrible thing when somebody has served in many cases 25 or 30 years uh, in prison for a crime that they are factually innocent of. Uh, where. They find confessions were coerced, and people later uh, retract those confessions. Or now, as you just say, uh, with the advancement in science, that if evidence has been preserved uh, scientifically, uh, people, I think now upwards of 100 people, have been exonerated uh, based on DNA evidence. And some people would say, well, you know, they probably were, probably did something anyway, or, uh, you know, it wasn't me, but God forbid, what if it is you or somebody near and dear to you who is falsely accused? Perhaps you don't have the funds to uh, hire a, a skillful lawyer or a team of lawyers. As most people don't have. Those cases that do go to trial and go to a jury trial, do Americans believe that you can get a fair trial with a jury? Do your clients believe they can get a fair trial with a jury? Are they a jury of their peers? One of the great misconceptions is, what is the definition of a jury of your peers? Give me a definition. Well, I can give you the legal definition and the practical definition. The practical definition would be people of the same age, same background, working in the same, edu same occupations with a similar educational background. Uh, that's not the case, a jury of your peers legally is somebody from the voting rolls that's registered to vote and is a citizen of the United States. That's it. There are those that say the majority of people facing criminal charges are guilty and that the job of the defense attorney is to find a way to get them off. True or false? Let's go through what the criminal process is and what it takes for somebody to be charged. A crime is reported. Let's say there are no independent witnesses. An individual calls and says, I was just out on a date with someone. We engaged in some uh, preliminary lovemaking. And I wanted to stop, and this person continu continued and write me. The person that is being accused will be arrested. That person, based on that evidence alone, will be charged. And that person, based on that evidence alone, will most likely have to face a jury. 
I don't know how anybody could say under those circumstances that if you're charged, you're guilty. That is a, uh, a shadow of a Kobe Bryant story, the case that is at the forefront of American public interest right now. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about a sexual charge for a moment. It's something that captivates people and they don't really understand it and they're afraid of it. This is a he said, she said situation. How is the defense going to get him off? How is the prosecution going to convict him? In my opinion that uh, it becomes something for the jury to make a decision on the credibility of the witness. But it's something more than that because... But the witness is the accuser. And most likely the accused. If only the accuser testifies, then that person's credibility is on trial. Depending on what a judge allows in for the jury to hear. Is it fair that the accuser in the Kobe case is persona invisible? Is it the right thing to do because it's a woman? Or in our age of equality, should she be as upfront and known to the public, to the court, to the television cameras as he is? I think uh, that women, uh, or men for that fact, that may be uh, victims or alleged victims are entitled to privacy. Uh, they are entitled to be able to come into court and have their case presented to the jury. Uh, I believe that there are protections that should attach to people who are uh, potentially victims of horrendous personal crimes. And so I think that is correct. But ultimately, in the courtroom, I do think that there should be uh, some areas that uh, a jury should be able to consider. And especially in the Kobe Bryant case, it's very clear to me that the jury should be able to consider whether or not this person had sex immediately before and immediately after the alleged incident, not to show her propensity for having sex, but to show that perhaps injuries might have occurred in a different way from a different person, or more importantly, for experts to testify as to what you would expect of someone who was really a victim of a rape. How would they be expected to act in the days, weeks, and even months after that horrendous event? if in fact it occurred. Lakers tonight, Kobe, Kobe's on his way back. Not guilty play. Yeah. It's a great thing to do. But you know, every time he's come back from Denver, mm -hmm. he's had a spectacular That's injury. True. Like spectacular a little fire game, in his belly. Which is amazing. Your career has been very much in the public view. By choice, or by happenstance? By happenstance. I, I never ever uh, would have imagined that uh, I would develop uh, the profile that I have. I started out uh, as a prosecutor in the district attorney's office. In Los in Angeles. Los Angeles. Uh, I then, uh, after about three years of really good and rigorous training, uh, became uh, a lawyer for the accused. And uh, I started out doing um, as many cases as the public defenders are doing today on a daily basis. Uh, anybody who walked into my office who wanted a lawyer had a lawyer virtually. When you were a kid, did you dream of being a lawyer? Was this an, a lifelong goal or was it something that came in college or later? I entered uh, UCLA in 1960 uh, as a pre-dental major. And then I discovered that my manual dexterity was such that I could not carve a tooth out of chalk. Was your dad a dentist? My dad drove a lunch truck. In Los Angeles? In Los Angeles. My mother uh, was a clothing salesman uh, in a woman's clothing store. So I was the first person uh, in my family to go to college. You've been married for 35 years. Your bio states in a profession and in a town when change is rapid and rampant. How come your marriage has lasted so long? Are you like in love with this woman? Well, obviously I'm in love with the woman. Uh, first of all, I've, I've been somebody who has been able to make decisions very quickly. 
All right, so what's the secret to a long marriage? What advice do you want to give 150 million high-definition television watchers? Trust your instincts immediately. Don't think about uh, whether or not it's right or wrong. Second guess, third guess, don't ask other people. Just, you know, if you feel it's right and she feels it's right, fine. And same then, thing in your profession? Same thing. You know, uh, I'm in the decision-making business. Same thing here in LegalZoom. We make decisions on a daily basis. All right, you brought up LegalZoom. This is an amazing, cutting-edge redefinition of the legal profession. Explain to our audience what LegalZoom is and how you're involved. LegalZoom is a internet company that allows the average American who does not know or cannot afford a lawyer the ability to avail themselves of every protection the law allows by way of documentation. It also allows people to be able to unfortunately dissolve a marriage through uh, a divorce. Fast and reasonable. Uh, fast is, is, is available. Uh, reasonable is, is something that we accomplish. The other thing is we help the courts because the majority of people who represent themselves in a courtroom divorce situation go up, they are given a ton of documents to fill out, they fill them out wrong, they're handed back, they ask the clerk, the clerk has points to a sign, don't ask me, I don't give advice. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. So at least uh, we get it right, we tell the people what they have to do. Uh, we certainly don't encourage people to get divorced, but if they've made that decision, uh, then we're available to help them. So you do procedures such as wills, trademarks, copyrights, divorce, what else? What are some of the common things that people would call LegalZoom for? I think one of the most important things is business protection for the person starting out in a small business. And you started this a few years ago and it has grown exponentially. Fortunately, I picked the right partners. Again, good, good quick decisions. Everybody around here is really young. And really smart. Really well, smart. I, I would agree with that. And they all say, when we ask them, what's Robert Shapiro really like? There's a word that keeps coming up, and it's not rehearsed. They all say, Bob Shapiro is an avuncular guy. What do they mean? You know, they're too smart for me. I, have, I don't have a clue. Uh, <laughs> I thought avuncular was something else, but we looked it up in the dictionary, and it says uncle-like nurturing, wise, taking you under the wing. Well, you know, You're pretty rough and tough to be a vuncular. Well, I don't know. I, I think uh, there's uh, some people that feel that way, but I, I think deep down I'm a lot different. And, and I think the public has gotten to know me through the years. But uh, uh, here, I have the opportunity to work with the best and the brightest, uh, people that have multiple degrees, people that have decided that uh, with a law degree, they'd rather be an entrepreneur than a lawyer, and that the future uh, holds more for them. My partner, Brian, my partner, Eddie, and the legal Zoom team. Done ten, tens of thousands of corporations. These people put them in the FedExes, ship them out, and people have their corporations within a week. America is torn apart over the treatment of Iraqi prisoners. This is bigger than a legal issue, but it is going to come down to one in terms of how our American servicemen are handled in terms of answering these charges. Is this such a political issue that these men will never really get a fair evaluation in a court, be it military or civilian? I happen to have some personal experience with this. Uh, about eight months ago, uh, I got involved in a military court-martial representing a young Marine who was accused of what I would call hazing. Uh, and I learned a lot about uh, what's happening now. And my feeling uh, for this young Marine who uh, was brought before 
a court for an Article 32, which is basically an indictment. This young Marine uh, had come right out of high school, volunteered, went through six weeks of infantry training uh, at a Marine base, and uh, went to Iraq. Uh, for 30 days was on the front lines, was involved in uh, serious combat, saw his friends uh, maimed, shot, injured in booby traps, was given no direction whatsoever after that 30 days, and told to patrol a perimeter outside a camp that they we're now in. The perimeter was undefined. And to make sure that people didn't come in and steal munitions and uh, other things that, that would benefit the enemy. They couldn't tell who the enemy was. They weren't in uniform. They didn't identify themselves. And the enemy could be a, a child carrying a bomb, a woman, uh, or somebody uh, who looked like a terrorist, but you couldn't tell the difference. And what uh, they did was be creative in trying to keep these people who could potentially pose a danger away. So they engaged in what I would refer to as hazing, which I was convinced was uh, something that uh, was condoned and that people were aware of. And uh, that was, I thought, would be uh, and will be a very valid defense. Uh, these cases, that may be the same thing. It may be that these things were done for the purpose of being able to try to get information from terrorists. And or try and protect the troops from further harm protect the troops, protect the civilians, everyone. I mean, this is a war zone. These are people are, are, are people, and innocent people uh, in uh, Iraq are getting blown up, are getting killed, are getting ambushed every day. And if this is a technique that is used to get information, I certainly don't condone it. But that doesn't mean others did not tell or approve or look the other way when this happens. So I think it is something that is not uh, going to be decided quickly. And I think that. Uh, will we be looking for scapegoats? Will we be of looking to point the finger? Well, of course. Of How high do you think it will go? By the time the show airs, we will know. But the clamoring for the resignation of Rumsfeld is getting louder and louder. But it seems to be a very political politically motivated clamor. Well, the president is uh, somebody who uh, is very close to uh, the Secretary of Defense. Uh, he's also shown uh, throughout his entire career to be somebody who is uh, incredibly loyal to, to other people. So uh, I doubt whether there will be any firing. And uh, I would be highly surprised if uh, Rumsfeld resigns. And, and really, uh, I don't know how you can hold somebody accountable unless they knew. I mean, he's in Washington. He's running the Pentagon. Uh, and I don't agree with uh, a lot of things that are taking place. I don't agree with the war myself. But I don't think that he is a person that should personally be held responsible. That's a very interesting point, because so many journalists at the very highest level are saying, the president knew, the secretary of defense knew, the generals knew, they all knew. And as you just said, they probably had no idea. Yeah. I, I, so it, the question is, should they have known? But you know what? Let's get off the subject. I want to talk about something else because we only got a few minutes left. I think we've got enough on that. Um, I want to talk about fame in your life and celebrity. It came on like a tidal wave with the O.J. Simpson uh, trial. Before that, you had had high-profile cases. I think Robert Evans was one of them. Christian Brando. Christian Brando, the, the, the murder, it was a very the murder case. case. Very, but, Probably the most high-profile case prior to Simpson. In the but country. you weren't a national household name prior to Simpson. You have been since. When you walk down the street, do people stop you, or has enough time passed? People say, you know, you look better in person. 
I was just going to say. <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> you look younger. Uh, you know, you are. If you're on television during the halftime of a basketball game as a picture in a crowd, for a week people are going to say, you know, I saw you on television. If you're on television every day for 16 months, and the whole world, is 10 watching. hours a day, and there is, and it's televised from CNN and. 200 countries. Do you have contact with all the players at this date some 10 years later? No. no. Because? A lot of the people I was not involved with before. It was uh, a team that I put together, that I hired every single expert, uh, every single lawyer involved in the case. Some of them I have consistent contact with. Uh, Dr. Henry Lee and I uh, have remained very, very uh, close. Uh, colleagues as well as friends, Dr. Michael Bodden, Alan Dershowitz and I uh, are frequent colleagues on cases. Uh, the, uh, the DNA people, uh, Barry Sheck, who did a great job, is in New York and uh, we don't have uh, much contact. Uh, Mr. Bailey and I have had a parting of the ways. Uh, Johnny Cochran and I never worked on a case before and haven't worked on one since. Interesting. I think America would think that you were still very much involved with a lot of these people. What about O.J.? Do you talk to him? I do not, but that's not unusual. Uh, I have both a civil practice and a criminal practice. My civil clients are ongoing, major corporations uh, that we deal with uh, on a yearly basis. On the criminal side, usually uh, you deal with the people once uh, and uh, never, hopefully never, never deal with them again. When it's over, and, it's over. And uh, so with, uh, with Simpson, I've seen him once since the trial. Uh, I wrote a book uh, about my life during the trial called The Search for Justice. And as a courtesy, I went to him, gave him the opportunity to read it, make any comments uh, that he wanted. And then on two other occasions, once at a car wash of all things, and once at a movie premiere. He still maintains his innocence. People of all walks of life have conflicting opinions on his innocence. Where do you stand? You know, there has never been a bifurcation of the American public along racial lines as there was in this case. Well, not in our lifetime, but there was in the last century. Well, it, or, it, for, for a criminal case, right. where if you look at African Americans, people viewed it in a way that the verdict was absolutely correct. And if you look at Caucasian Americans, they view it in a way that the verdict was absolutely incorrect, and they all heard the same evidence. I, I will say this, that there were, there were two trials. There was a civil trial and a criminal trial. In a criminal trial, it was absolutely clear to me then, and it's clear to me now, that the prosecution did not do their job, and that the verdict, based on reasonable doubt, was absolutely correct in the legal sense. The civil jury, again, had a different burden. They had a preponderance of the evidence. There was a difference in those trials. In that trial, Mr. Simpson was required to testify on the civil side. On the criminal side, you cannot be required to testify. And I believe the civil judgment was absolutely correct. You certainly wrapped it up. And I'd like to thank you very much. It's been a very interesting hour. Thank you, and uh, it was a sensational interview. And you have great insight. And I really appreciate the time we spent together. It's been our great pleasure. OK, back to work. I'm Bruce W. Cook, ladies and gentlemen, and this is Bruce W. Cook Interviews. It is a celebrity interview show about life and times and issues and thoughts and emotions and feelings and anything that the television camera can convey. Anything important, serious, and also funny and lighthearted and hopefully inspirational from time to time.